My name is Mark Westcott. I'm the principal investigator for the um, UK RI Research Council funded project, The Year of the Dealer, of which Quinny's, this play we're um, recreating, um, is a central part. The play was first performed in 1915, and it's, it's a play about an antique dealer. Uh, and this is the original playbill for the play. And what we try to do in the set and in the recreation is get as close as possible to how it was performed in 1915 originally, using original antique furniture um, rather than theatre sets. Um, as it was performed in 1915, a number of leading antique dealers of the time also loaned antiques for the first performance, including a dealer called Walter and Ernest Thornton Smith. And this is a brochure that they produced in 1915, so the same date as the play. And interestingly, Walter and um, Ernest um, Thornton Smith were it located in Soho Square, the fictional location of Quinney's fictional antique shop in 1915. And what we've done, we've asked local antique dealers from Yorkshire to loan us some of the set. So um, this, this cabinet, for example, George II, so it dates from about 1750, is on loan from R.N. Myers and son, Simon Myers in Gargrave. Um, this um, fabulous early 19th century desk um, is on loan from David Love in Harrogate, um, and a number of other things on loan from Tony Lum, from Charles Lum and Sons, and a number of other antique dealers have loaned the set. Interestingly, this desk, um, if I opened, you can't see this, but it's stamped on the drawer, James Winter and Sons, Great uh, Queen Street in London. Now, Winter and Sons were originally very early antique dealers, um, trading in Wardour Street in the 1820s. And so this desk would have been retailed by them as second-hand in the 1850s when they sold it. It's now become an antique, of course. But it's quite interesting that these narratives about second-hand furniture and antique dealing. Uh, there are other um, reality effects, if you like, that we're trying to recreate um, in, uh, in the play. This is a little box, um, a little tobacco box, which says Quinny's on the front, tobacco. And when you open it, this also dates from about 1915, um, it has a little picture of a, an antique shop in, Her in Hartford, Quinney's Antique Shop, uh, and after 1915, when the play um, was performed, it was very successful, and it um, acted as a catalyst for lots of antique shops called Quinney's. In fact, we've traced over 20 of them um, throughout the 20th century. So if you said you were going to Quinney's um, in the 1920s, people would know that actually what you meant, you were going to the antique shop. And we've also dropped a, a, no a number of other um, reality effects in um, as kind of dressing, if you like, from the, this is the original novel of Quinney's, which was actually produced in 1914, a year before the play. So this is the original novel that um, Horace Vashel, who is the writer of Quinney's, produced. He was a very prolific writer, produced over a, a hundred plays and uh, novels through, throughout his life. Uh, and the other things that we try to get for the set, um, including uh, this cabinet on stand, this is actually a replacement object for an object we really wanted, which is a, a lacquer cabinet of um, the Charles II period, so we're about 1680, which was just almost impossible to, to get. So we've got this substitute um, cabinet on stand, uh, which is actually late 18th century rather than late 17th century. And rather than it being lacquer, it's, it's called um, uh, told paint. So it's actually called Pontypool as well, because they produced this in the 18th century in Pontypool in Wales. So it's a painted effect on tin. And what we've done inside, again, in terms of reality effect, We've got lots of books in here that Quinney would have been familiar with in the early 20th century. Quinney mentions in the play uh, some of his things he would like them to be, or they were, hope, he was hoping they were going to the South Kensington Museum, as it was then called. It's now called the V&A. Um, but there are a number of catalogues in here from the South Kensington Museum. So things that Quinney would have looked at in 1915. Um, one of the stars of the play is a set of eight Chippendale chairs, one of which you can see in the front there. Uh, and we also have in here, um, interestingly, the furniture of Thomas Chippendale, produced in 1915 as well. So it, it, you know, again, related to the kind of things that Quinn would be reading. And then on this side of the room, um, we tried to get a lacquer screen, but again, it, was, it proved impossible to get. So we had this um, 18th century Dutch painted leather screen um, and it's again it, it required us to change the te make minor adjustments to the to the script um, which we don't think um, uh, um, kind of had sig significant impact on the, on the script at least on the play uh, and this is another replacement object um, this was supposed to be a Charles II chair 
um, that Quinny, the antique dealer, kind of muses on uh, and talks about it being a, a kind of representation of British constitutional history. And we've replaced it with this, um, this is called a Woolsey chair. It's a chair that, um, this is a 19th century copy of a chair that was produced in the 16th century, believed to have been um, produced for Cardinal Woolsey, who was one of the uh, ministers for Henry VIII, if you remember. Um, and these were collected in the 18th century um, and were called by Horace Walpole, the great um, 18th century antiquarian and collector, the true black blood, because these were made out of ebony um, with a black color on them. So he wanted the true black blood when he was collecting. And again, we adjusted the script to reflect this, this kind of minor change. And the other thing that we, that's really interesting about the play is that obviously it's a fictional antique. Joseph Quinney does not exist. He's a fictional dealer, but he was actually based on a real antique dealer called Thomas Rowan. And we put this photograph, of Tom, this is a 1920s photograph of Thomas Rowan in this silver frame. Rowan was based in Bournemouth in around about 1900, 1910. He was a great friend of Horace Vachel, who wrote Quinney's. Uh, and interestingly, Rowan wrote, um, was one of the first dealers to write his own autobiography in 1926. Um, and he was a great dealer in, in um, antique glass. He sold a lot to William Burrell, the Burrell collection in Glasgow. So we put this 18th century glass as a kind of homage to Rowan's specialism on the, these are all kind of things that you might not know about unless you know about the, the kind of history of the trade, I guess. And the other, the other object um, that we were very pleased to get is this um, spectacular painted table. This is from David Love in Harrogate. Um, one of the antiques of loaned objects for the set. Um, this, is, this is described in the play um, as a, a painted table by Cipriani, who's an 18th century painter, effectively he decorate furniture in the 18th century. It does date from, eight, from about 1780. It is a genuine antique uh, and it's an exceptionally rare survivor. Painted furniture tends not to survive, as you might imagine, because it, it paint falls off, it gets, you know, different environmental, environmental conditions, and they're often kind of restored, but this is a, a really interesting, genuine example from 1780. Um, and we had a spectacular stool, um, which again is in the play. This one um, dates from the mid 18th century, George II, as he would have called it. This one on loan from Simon Myers, um, from R.N. Myers and Sons in Galgrave, um, and with its original 18th century tapestry on it. So it's again, quite a rare survival in terms of the um, the set that we have. Uh, and we also have, um, I guess, this is perhaps one of the obscure things um, in terms of the play. It doesn't directly relate to the play, but this is a, um, a portrait in pastel of Mrs. Patrick Campbell, who was the original model for Eliza Doolittle. In fact, George Bernard Shaw wrote Pygmalion for Mrs. Patrick Campbell. So this is Matrick, Mrs. Patrick Campbell in the, in the guise of Eliza Doolittle, which was written in 1914, of course, um, Pygmalion. So again, it's a kind of homage to a kind of a period detail that maybe if you'd been you know, watching the play in 1915, you would kind of expect to see this kind of thing on Quinney's walls as, as a, a kind of contemporary work of art, if you like. Uh, and um, finally, um, the piece de resistance, if you like, the center, um, and perhaps one of the most important characters above the actors in the play, are the set of um, eight Chippendale chairs. We couldn't get a set of eight ribbon back chairs, uh, which are quite rare, they date from about seven, mid 1750s. But what we did manage to get is this, um, these rather nice 19th century copies of Chippendale chairs. They're in the Gothic style um, with brackets and little bits of Chinese um, uh, detail on, on the legs. Uh, and we managed to get six of these. Um, and again, it, what we needed to do was kind of change the text, the script ever so slightly um, when they were talking about, you know, feel the ribbon, or look at the, the ribbon back carving. We're not, we, we couldn't do that because there is no ribbon back carving on this chair. And we, we were conscious that um, because this is a play about antique dealing, uh, because we really wanted to recreate it as much as possible in terms of its authenticity, that we would have some antique dealers in the audience. And if we started to play around with the, their expectations about what a ribbon back chair would be, they would automatically say, well, it's a fake. And we didn't want to kind of layer that extra kind of dimension of fakery and forgery um, in the narratives, which are already complicated enough in terms of the way that um, uh, Quinney's is, is kind of set out, because these chairs um, are fakes in the play as well. In the interval, I'll take you through Sam Tomlin's set, which is the second set um, in um, uh, Quinney's play. Uh, and as I say, Quinney's set, his sanctuary, as it's called, 
um, in the play was loaned by leading and, um, antique dealers in London at the time, and Sam Tomlin's set, by contrast, was loaned by Lyons Tea House in 1915. Thank you.